We're going to continue this morning with the uh, series that um, we have been, that we started on last week, we, and it's not so much a, a series as we're just kind of coming back to the same topic again. We're coming back to the same area, um, and what I have found is, as I've gone through this, uh, the, the hard part has been not including scriptures. There are so many wonderful, encouraging passages about this that, uh, that help us as we look to the Lord and as we are encouraged and as we find strength in the Lord. And I was especially encouraged this morning as uh, Brother Kim, as he led us in prayer, just as he did, he read from Isaiah 40. Do you know that that's a passage that we all know so very well, but do you know that as I was preparing yesterday, um, I had, that was one of the passages, and I wanted so badly to include that, but I looked at the scriptures that I had and the time that I would have today, and I knew that that could not be. And so um, the Holy Spirit prompted Kim and, and brought it up. We got it anyhow. Maybe we'll get to it next week. We'll see how it goes. So we're going to continue today, and you'll see that the, uh, pa that the title is very similar to last week. If you remember last week, we talked about finding strength and encouragement in God or in the Lord. And that came from 1 Samuel chapter 30 uh, when da in verse 6 when uh, David, everybody turned against him, when everything was going wrong, and it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. David found strength in the Lord his God. And we're going to go further down that path this morning and be encouraged as well. And I'm going to give, we're going to look at a few new scriptures, but we're going to look at some of the same ones as well because there's so much there. And very often when we go to something, as we go back again and again, the Holy Spirit opens up more to us. So we want to uh, look together at this today. Finding strength, and we're going to be a little bit specific today. Read, recall, rejoice. We're going to look at these three things. But I want us, w I want you to join with me in thinking about this. Hang on just a second. My eyes are okay, but they're not that okay. Do you know how small that is? Wait just a minute. There we go. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's better. And I want to, as we begin talking about this, I want to encourage you as we continue talking about this. When we go through hard times, and David is our example again. So David is there. They've come back. Um, everything's going wrong. David, now me, I run from fights. I, I, don't know, I don't know how guys, I think guys are different. But in school, um, whenever there was a fight, I'm so sorry, you know that um, somebody would say, fight, fight, right? We know, right? And a bunch of people go running the other direction, and a bunch of people go running for the fight, right? <laughs> and so um, for me, I would always go running in the other direction. I hated conflict, and my brother just loved a good fight. Just he, he, he loved a good fight. He'd hear fight, fight, and he'd just go running for it. I don't know if it's a guy-girl thing. I'm not sure. But anyhow, um, David, as we look at this, David although I would have been so happy when uh, King Achish says, David, I'm sorry, the other Philistine kings, they don't trust you. You can't fight, go home. Um, I'd be going, yay! But David and his band of warriors, all 600 of them, did not look at it that way. They were warriors. They were soldiers. They fought. And so they go home. They're kept from fighting. They go home when they get, when they, and they've been traveling all this way. They get back. They're tired. Their homes are gone. Everything is burned. Their families are gone. Their children are gone. All their livestock is gone. There's, no, there's nothing there because they went off traveling fast and light as they went off to war, and they come back to nothing. And then, as we know, we talked about this, what happens at the same time, we know that the devil gets in it, as he always does, and they, they start believing the lie. It's David's fault, right? Any time, brothers and sisters, any time we're going through a valley, or through a, we're facing a hard thing, and we have feelings of hopelessness, we have feelings of discouragement, we have feelings of isolation, we can be sure that the enemy is at work. Any of those, any of those things, or fear as well. The enemy is at work. That is his calling card. And so there's David, and he is, uh, he's facing the prospect of death by stoning from his own soldiers, and it looks as if, the picture we see is he's hopeless and alone. So I want to ask you something, some of you, as we are already this new year starting that we had great hopes for, you feel overwhelmed. 
and you have felt hopeless and alone. And we've already started talking about that this uh, last week. But what I want us to see is this. One of the lies of the enemy, a go-to lie of the enemy in times like this is the feeling of I am on my own, is the feeling of I don't have anybody else I can count on, is the feeling, come on, we're really good Christians, but how many of us have ever felt God, you may be, maybe you even said it, maybe you even prayed it, God, where are you? God, I'm all alone. God, don't you care? Now, the reason I know that we are just like this is because his disciples were just like that. Remember when Jesus was in the middle of the storm, in the, in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, and the waves start swamping, the boat starts coming over and over and over, and what do the disciples say to Jesus, who is, by the way, in the boat with them. Master, master, don't you care that we perish? In other words, they felt that in the night, in the storm, in the middle of the lake, they were on their own. They were all alone. And that is a lie of the enemy. And David faces the same thing. So I want us to see something as we look at this. And these are, these are some verses that we looked at last week from Isaiah 41.10. And I want us to see something. Isaiah writes the words of the Lord, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I'll strengthen you, help you. I'll hold on to you with my righteous right hand. And I want, you, I want us to see this morning as we look at this, as we look at this, the, the, the communication of God, the word of God, the direction of God is as we go through these things, you are not alone. I am with you. And it's not just I'm with you, but there's a very strong sense of personal presence, isn't there? Which is an encouragement to us to know he's not just God in the, hev God in the heavens and he cares for his people, but he is a personal God and he cares about you and he cares what you're going through. And we see this. Don't, don't you see it in Isaiah 41.10? For I am with you. I am your God. I'm your God. Whatever you're facing this morning, whatever you're up against this morning, he is your God. You are not on your own in your battle against cancer. You are not on your own in attempting to put food on the table for your family when it's hard to do. You are not on your own. Your God is with you. Your God is with you. Um, remember, and we're going to look at this in just a minute, but in the same passage, Isaiah 41, verse 14, a few verses later, look at what when the Lord is speaking to him, he says, your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Isn't that encouraging? It's that sense of personal presence of the Lord again. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, the one who buys you back. When you and I are in the devil's clutches, when you and I feel under it, when you and I feel tra trapped, your Redeemer, your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you of a verse that you know so very well. From Psalm 23, look with me. We know it. Most of you have it memorized. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want all of this. Now, the whole psalm is about the good shepherd with us, but I want you to see one thing that you may not have noticed before. Look with me at Psalm 23, verse 4. In the valley of the shadow of death, what does he say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? You are with me. You are with me. If you read the rest of that psalm, you will see that he leads them, he lets them lie down, he prepares a table before them, but in the valley of the shadow of death, he declares, you are with me, you are with me. And that's something God wants us to grab hold of as we go through these things, when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel on our own, when we're fighting battles that we all fight in different areas. He is with us. That is the time when he most clearly and most strongly says to you, I am with you. And look at the two things, your rod and your staff. Don't you find it interesting that it's a rod and it's a staff? Of course, 
those are shepherd's tools. Of course, those are shepherd's tools. But the shepherd sometimes has to do battle, doesn't he? David had to do battle as a shepherd. But your rod and your staff, and that, to me that's so encouraging because it's not a bow and an arrow which you can shoot way off. Rods and staffs are held in the hand of the shepherd, and he's up close with us. He's up close with us. Your rod and your staff. God is close enough with you that he's fighting the battle, battle there with you. Look at another one. Psalm 29, verse 11. For an encouragement this morning. The Lord gives who? His people strength. The Lord blesses who? His people with peace. The Lord is with you. I love that verse, and I, I didn't look it up, but... Uh, um, uh, the Lord is an ever, I bet Pastor Jake knows the reference. The Lord is an ever present help in time of trouble. He's ever present. He's there with us. Hallelujah. And if you say, where is that? Look it up, but not right now. Amen. So the enemy is there to accuse. He doesn't care. He's far from you. You're on your own. But God, in response to that, says, I am with you. You're not on your own. I am with you as you go through this. So number one, God is personally invested in you and God is personally with you. Next, let's see. Let's go back to this one again. How are you worms doing this week? Were you a worm this week? I, I, throughout the week, I, I thought about that and I would laugh and I'd say, hey, worm Ida. Hi, worm Melrose. How you doing? As we, as we were working this week. Our weakness invites his strength. That's the next point. Our weakness invites his strength. That's why those verses that Kim read um, this morning and the verses that come right before that, uh, it's such a perfect uh, fit with this in Isaiah 40. Oh, Israel, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? How can you say God refuses to hear your case, right? I'm alone. God, where are you? I'm on your own. And Isaiah says, don't you know, haven't you understood? He never grows faint, faint or weary. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youths will become exhausted. Young men will give up. But those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And as we go through these times, beloved, there will be times when the pressure is on and the race is on and you will have to run. You're going to have to run. There are times of, of high stress like that when you've got to run. He provides strength for running. And there are other times when you and I are going to have to put one foot in front of another day after day after day when you think, is this going to go on forever? And it just keeps on going. And when are the COVID cases going to go down? And it just keeps on going. And when are the restrictions going to lift? And they just keep on going. When is this going to change? When is this going to happen? And sometimes you and I will have to just keep walking. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. You know, often for some of us, the running, we can do it. But it's the walking that gets us down, isn't it? It's the day after day after day when it doesn't change. And God gives strength in those times as well. Our weakness invites his strength. It's good to know that our God does not squish worms. In my family, we squish worms because they eat plants in the garden and they eat flowers in the garden. It's great to be a worm in God's eyes because our weakness and our inability and our lack invites his intervention, his provision, and his strength. Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you people of Israel, for I will help you, declares the Lord. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. We looked, we looked at that already. We cannot control circumstances, but we can choose how we respond and how we react. Go to him as a worm. <laughs> 
go to him as a worm. I want you to think with me for just a minute. Think of all of the instances in the Bible. Most of us know the Bible quite well. Think of all the instances in the Bible when God's people were worms before the troubles, were worms before their enemies, were little helpless insects before the great and mighty horde. Think of Abraham when he went to save, when he went to save his, his nephew Lot. It was Abraham and his trained men from his household that defeated four mighty kings. Why? Because he was strong in the Lord. Think with me of the children of Israel leaving Egypt. Egypt, the strongest nation, the strongest empire of that time, the most powerful. They, Egypt was known for its strength for its army, and not only were they strong, they had instruments of war, and not only that, did they have chariots and horses as well. That's why a little bit later, when Israel begins to have a king, do you know what God says to his people? Do not gather for yourself horses and chariots. God wanted his people to know, I am your strength. I am your strength. And you and I, it's still the same thing for us today. But think of that. The children of Israel leaving Egypt and God defeated them. The worms as they went across the Red Sea. Think of Gideon and his band of men. And God said, you have too many men, Gideon. You need to know that you're a worm and I'm the strong one. And he whittles down that band of warriors until it's a handful compared to the army. Remember Jehoshaphat standing before, the, before God with all of the people, the men, the women, and the children as well, as they stood before God. Remember, we looked at this a few months ago, and Jeho Jehoshaphat's prayer on behalf of the nation is what? Oh, God, you see this vast army coming, to, coming for us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And you and I, I it kind of looks like 2022 is shaping up that way already, doesn't it? This vast army that's ahead of us, this vast wilderness that's ahead of us, all of these things that we cannot control. You can't control it. Oh, well, we won't get into politics, but can't control Omicron either, can you? Can't control it. We cannot control circumstances. Do you know what we can do? Lord, here I am, and I bring my heart to you. I am a worm. And God says, don't worry, I take care of worms. Let me give you my strength. Amen, amen. You know this verse, but I want to remind you. Paul, the great Paul, the great Paul, who had had visions of heaven or maybe had been taken to heaven. Paul says, I don't know. I don't know which one it was. And he says, God, please take away this thorn in the flesh. Please take away this weakness in me. Please take away this thing, this problem, this whatever it was, all sorts of speculations. Please take this away so that I can be strong, so that I can serve you, so that I can minister. That, that was really what part of it, that, that's what it was, so that this thing doesn't limit me. And what does God say to Paul? No, I'm not taking it away. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul's response at that point is, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardship, persecution, difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Oh, that one's a hard one for us, isn't it? When I'm weak, then I'm strong. But when we are weak before the Lord, the Lord comes in like a mighty rushing river, and he is strong on our behalf. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to read to you. Let me read to you a different translation of this. I think this is ESV. I'm not sure. Um, this is from the Phillips, the Phillips, uh, Phillips paraphrase, not a translation, the Phillips, J.B. Phillips paraphrase. Three times I begged the Lord for it to leave me, but his reply has been, my grace is enough for you. For where there is weakness, my power is shown the more completely. Therefore, I have cheerfully made up my mind to be proud of my weaknesses because they mean a deeper experience of the power of Christ. 
I can even enjoy weaknesses, suffering, privations, persecutions, and difficulties for Christ's sake. For my very weakness makes me strong in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is our reaction? May it be what the reaction of David was. We looked at this last time. When everything comes against him, David says he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. There's the personal touch again, isn't it? There's a personal touch. And I've included it, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Amen. Amen. So how do we encourage ourselves in the Lord? And I want to be very practical for just a few minutes um, uh, as we look at this. And you saw it in the title already. And we're going to look at three words that will help us, that show us just how to be practical, how we can be, how we can encourage ourselves in the Lord, how we can receive strength in the Lord our God. And the first one, very simply, I used the word read. Although when I say read, I don't necessarily mean you have to read. You have to go to the Bible and read because some of us have the parts of the Bible memorized, right? Or sometimes we listen to the Bible as well. I do that quite often when I'm driving, uh, when I'm driving back and forth uh, from new territories to, light, uh, to Lighthouse. I often, I'll be listening uh, to, the, to my online Bible and I enjoy it so much as I go back and forth. But I use the word read because that has to do with the Word of God. So here are three practical ways. The first one is go to the Word of God. Let me give you a verse for that. Psalm 119, 28. And this fits with what we're talking about. I'm weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word, through your word. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you as, as we go ahead in this new year, whether, whether you want to call it 2022 or the year of the tiger. I don't care what you call it. It's okay. But what I want to encourage you in is this. Go with the word of God. That's why I liked so much the uh, welcome slide that has been designed uh, for us, specifically at Lighthouse. We saw the blessing, uh, and we'll look at this again next week, but what's at the bottom of that? The Word of God, right? Okay. There we go. There we go. Just take a quick look at that. Some of us don't read or write any Chinese at all. Some of us do. So there's that blessing, fu or fuk. Um, and it's, it's blessing, and I like it because it's God blessing his people, but it's based on the word of God. Amen. So as we go into the new year, okay, we can go back to Psalm 119, 28 now. As we go into the new year, go in the word of God. I'm weary from grief. Are some of you weary from grief? Are some of you weary from grief? If you are, if you are, strengthen, be strengthened through the Word of God. Why? Because our feelings go up and down, right? Situations get better and situations get worse. How many of you thought the situation was going to get better? How many of you were already planning for your Chinese New Year reunion banquet this year? This year? And you've already canceled your reservations, haven't you? And I'm not making, f I'm really not making fun of that. I, I'm really not. I, it's, it's an important, it's an important part. But the point is we plan and we hope and things get better and things get worse. But there's one thing that never changes and it's the word of God. It's the word of God. And so strengthen me through your word. Uh, some translations say according to your word or the promises of your word. Same thing. S Proverbs 30 verse 5. Why do we go to the Word of God? Why is that one of the ways that we uh, uh, receive strength? Because every Word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Every word proves true. The enemy's going to lie to you like anything this year. He's going to try to get you to think this. He's going to try to get you to think that. But when you go to the Word of God, you will always get the truth. You will always get the truth. Um, you know this scripture so very well, but I just want to remind you of it. And I've been praying about this. I, I believe the Holy Spirit is leading us. We're going to be talking about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the armor of the Lord sometime later in this year. So a lot of you know this one very well, but um, you've studied it before. But I'm thinking this is one of the ways the Lord is leading us. Ephesians 6.17. Uh, in, in Ephesians 6.10, what does he say first of all? And he says, uh, take up, uh, first of all, he says, pray, 
Um, he says, stand, and then he says, take up these, th- these things of warfare. And I just remind you, of Ephesians six seventeen, the helmet of salvation and what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. This is your weapon. This is your weapon. Take up the sword of the Spirit. When the enemy begins to throw darts of lies and doubt and discouragement, that is when you and I are going to have to depend not on how we feel, not on the circumstances, but on what the Word of God says, right? We're going to have to depend on that. Let me encourage you uh, from Romans 15, 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have what? Hope. Hope. It's a bad thing when you don't have hope, isn't it? But when there's hope in your heart, you can keep going, can't you? When there's hope in your heart, you are strengthened to keep on on going. And so the first thing, get into the Word of God. Get into the Word of God. I want to encourage you also, when you read Psalms, a lot of times you will see David a lot of times when he's writing the Psalms, but David is not the only writer of the Psalms. But you will see so often, um, they must have had insomnia back then. How many times, as I lay on my bed at night, I this, this, and this. That was me last night. And my neighbors down below started practicing violin at 1030 last night. Really started at 1030. And I was wondering what I could do. But (laughs) instead I prayed (laughs) and I tried to sleep. But you know, they had insomnia, didn't they, in the Psalms? And through the night watches, as I lay on my bed, I, whatever. I want to encourage you in one thing. Very often, David and the other writers will say, I meditated on your word, right? I meditated on your word. And in the Hebrew, do you know what that word meditate means? It actually means to murmur, to murmur, not complain, but to repeat, to say over and over again. And it was, it came out of knowing the word of God and they would just, the word of God would be in their mouths and they would repeat the words of God as they, as they lay on their bed through the night. And so when you see that word, as I meditated, that's actually what it means. There is a physical action involved in what they were doing. So the first one is read or go to the word of God. I can't tell you, I've told you this before, but I can't tell you how many times I have been so grateful for a hands-on mom. I, I, love my, I loved my dad, but dad didn't do that part. This was mom's part, who taught her children the scriptures and made us memorize scriptures that I still rely on to this day, to this day, as I begin to quote, and it's, it's scriptures that mom helped us memorize when we were five and six years old, and she paid us for it too. Yes! The five cents is long gone, but the word of God remains in my heart. Amen? Amen. I'm not making a point about parenting. Well, I guess I am, but anyhow. (laughs) And then years later, when mom was here in Hong Kong, in case you didn't know this, mom was teaching some of the really, really well-to-do ladies on the island. And you know what she did? She started working on scripture memorization with them, and she bribed them, too. And she'd give them bookmarks and this and that. Oh, they worked so hard to memorize the books of the Bible and other things as well. Whatever works. So read. Number two, recall. Number two is recall. So read is the first one. Number two is recall. Or if you want to use the word remember, you can do that as well. Remember what God has done. Remind yourself of who he is. Bring up his faithfulness to you and others in the past. Look at 1 Chronicles 16, 12. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his wonders and the judgments he has pronounced. Now, as David was facing those 600 men who wanted to stone him, I don't know what he said, but I have an idea as he encouraged himself in the Lord. Do you know what I think he might have said? I think he might have been on his face before God or his hands lifted to God. And I think he might have been saying, Oh God, I remember when I was but a boy taking care of the sheep and the lion came up. And oh God, you strengthened my hands and I tore that lion apart and protected the sheep. Thank you, God, for protecting me then. I think he might have said, God, I remember 
when I was a young boy and the bear came to attack the sheep. And, oh, God, you strengthened my hands. And I killed the bear and I protected the sheep. I wonder if David was saying, thank you, God. I remember when I was a young man and I was too small to wear the armor of Saul, but I came before the giant Goliath in your name, O God, and you defeated the enemy. And I thank you, O God. I thank you for what you've done. O God, when I faced an enemy greater than I was, you protected me in the past. You protected me from the bear, from the lion from Goliath, from Saul. Surely, oh God, you will protect me now against these 600 men who want to stone me to death. Do you think that might have been his recall? Total recall, if you want to get a movie reference in there. Do you think that might have been in his thoughts? I think it might have been. What happens when we recall? What happens when we remember? We are reminded of the faithfulness of God. We are reminded of the love of God. We are reminded that God has never failed us. We are reminded that even when we were jerks, scriptural term, or idiots, another scriptural term, when we caused our own problems, God still didn't abandon us. God still didn't forsake us. He still loved us, and he was with us working on our behalf. Recalling and remembering stirs up faith in our hearts and a, rem and, and a reminder of who God is and what he has done. Let me read to you. I'm going to skip some, huh, I'm going to skip some verses. Moses is getting ready to let the people go into the, into the promised land. He's not going to go. Joshua is going to go. Look with me at Deuteronomy 7, a wonderful passage. And he says, he, he's not going to go. They're going. And he says, you may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? Now, I want to go ahead and go hand in hand with them right now. How many of you are facing issues or problems? It may even be something in yourself and you're looking at it and you think, God, how can I do this? How many of you? Yeah? How can I overcome this? How can I go beyond this? Well, you're in a good place. You're in the same place that the children of Israel, children of Israel were. Verse 18. But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. So pause for just a minute as you face these difficulties. Pause as you place these as you face these places where you've been defeated again and again and again, and the devil lies to you and says, you will never overcome this. It will always be your downfall. It will always be a, a tripping, a, 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 a stumbling block. Thank you. A stumbling block for you. And God says... Through the word inspired of Moses, do not be afraid. Remember well what the Lord your God did. So whatever you're facing this morning, take a minute right now and just think. Think back. How has the Lord, how has the Lord worked on your behalf before? How has the Lord won the victory for you before? How has the Lord provided when you did not have enough to meet the need, whether it was in your pocketbook or on the table or in grace? Remember the Lord. What is the next verse? Verse 19. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the miraculous signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples you now fear. When we look back and recall, when we look back and remember, faith begins to rise in our hearts for who God is and what, we, what he will do. And it prepares us for what is yet ahead. We don't know what is yet ahead, but our God has been faithful in the past. Early this morning, I, I wanted to include this story. I wanted to include this story as we, come, as we, come, as we approach the end. I wanted to include this story because it was really on my heart yesterday and it's something that our family often has said and it comes from the lips of my mother and y you know I've talked with you before our our families my family growing up and we we were not well to do or wealthy in any way praise the Lord if God has blessed people with that but often often that is not the case and on my dad's side it was a very simple family hardworking, um, never a lot extra and on my mom's side, you know that my grandfather, mom's dad, was a doctor. But much of his practice, so it was in, they were in upstate New York and then in Washington, D.C. 
and it was during the uh, it was during the Great Depression in the U.S. And that's when I mean everybody everybody was suffering, and um, people would pay. Grand, grandpa was already, I mean, they were Christians by that time. Mom was a small child. And people would pay Grandpa. Either they wouldn't pay him, and Grandpa would still treat people. And he was always very reasonable in his, his rates. In fact, even other doctors would get angry because his rates were very reasonable. He says, no, that's all they can afford to pay. But people would pay in groceries. But a lot of times, because the times were so difficult, they would give him spoiled food canned things or things that were expired or, or messed up already and, and, and not good. So it was, it was tough times. So in my family, um, as I have grown up, my mom, whenever we've gone through tough times, whenever we haven't had enough, my mom goes to the Word. And what comes from her mouth is this. You know, a lot of you know this. Psalm 37, verse 25, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. That's a modern translation, but a lot of us know it in the uh, uh, King James. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And this is, co this is common in my family. When I've faced uh, difficulties, when our family has faced difficulties, do you know where it comes from? It comes from this time when my mom was a small child. And... There was not enough food on the table. And mom said that grandma and grandpa that night put the children to bed. There were four children at that time. Uncle Luke went to be with the Lord very, very young. And um, so he was still alive at that time. And they put all the children to bed. And then grandma and grandpa got down on their knees and they began to pray. Because the next morning they knew we have milk to feed the children, but we have no bread. We have no bread. So they got on their knees to pray, God, we need bread. The children need bread. They didn't go to somebody else. They didn't look for another source. They begged God. They went to God. That's where we go. That's where we go because he's our supply. And you know what they prayed? God the children need bread. They knew that verse. They were getting ready for bed about midnight. A knock on their door. In those days, nobody stayed up that late. And there was a lady in the church, and she was at the door, and she had a big brown bag. And they invited her in. Grandma invited her in, and she came in. And she looked in the bag, you know, of course, because it came in with the bag. And in the bag, loaves and loaves of bread. Loaves of bread. And Grandma said to her, Oh, sister, we've been praying for bread. And do you know how it came about? This lady was a baker. And every Saturday morning, she would bake bread for the week. That was a common way of doing it. She would bake bread for the week. And that morning, as she was baking bread, the Holy Spirit had told her, bake extra bread for the Miller family. They need bread. And the lady said, no, Lord, I can't do that. He's a doctor. I'll offend them if I take bread. They don't need bread. And she didn't make the bread. But all day long, she couldn't get away from it. She couldn't get away from it. It was on her heart. It was on her heart. Bread for the millers, bread for the millers. Until finally Saturday night, late, late Saturday night, while she was getting ready for bed, she said, okay, Lord, okay, Lord. And she got up and she mixed the dough and she made bread and she baked it and she brought it to them. I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor is seed begging bread. And in my family, that is a testimony of God's faithfulness. When I don't know what I'm going to do, when we don't know where we're going to get the resources, not just physical, but their emotional and spiritual needs too, aren't there? When we need, oh God, where? Oh God, how? Oh God, I'm so weak. I don't have it. I don't have it. He never leaves his children hungry 
when we go to him. And if you will go to him, God, I recall, I recall your faithfulness in days of old. It may be a time of great need. It may be a time when there is spiritually nothing on your table. Remember Psalm 23, he prepares a table before me. And when we recall, when we recall, faith begins to rise and we begin to gain strength again. Amen. 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 It's time to stop. You, we'll give you the last word next week. How about that? Read, recall, and the last one is rejoice. We're going to take more time for rejoice next week. But I want to close with a psalm, and then we're going to close the service. I, I just want to, let me go ahead and give you a psalm for us to close with this morning. Look with me. But I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the morning, for you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength. Oh, there's a great name for God, isn't it? My strength. Next time you're feeling especially wormy, my strength. <laughs> my strength. I sing praises because God is my stronghold, my faithful God, my faithful God. Lord, we thank you. We read, we come to your word. Lord, we recall you have never failed us. You have been our stronghold, our strength, our strength. And Lord, as we wait upon you, we will. We do find strength. You've done it before. You'll do it again. You're doing it now. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We are worms. Oh, God, we're worms. But we come to you. We come to you. Display your power. Be evident in our lives and through our lives and in our circumstances and in our family and in our finances and in our health and in our hearts and in our thoughts and in the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts and the steps that we take each day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Our strength. Amen, amen, amen.